Sometimes the best part of history is just a, a ripping yarn, one of those stories where truth is stranger than fiction. Like that day in 1966 when a Royal Air Force ground crewman accidentally took off in one of the world's fastest aircraft. If for no other reason than it's just a darn exciting story, it is history that deserves to be remembered. On July 22, 1966, Royal Air Force Wing Commander Walter Taffy Holden was in the cockpit of a Lightning F-1 fighter interceptor on runway 36 at RAF Lynham. Introduced in 1959, the English Electric Lightning was a very fast aircraft that used a unique staggered configuration of two Rolls-Royce Avon turbojet engines within the fuselage. The F-1 was the first production model of the Lightning, and the Lightning remains, to this day, the fastest UK-designed and built fighter aircraft in history, with later models capable of reaching Mach 2. At the time, the United Kingdom's nuclear armed strategic bomber force was called V-Force, referring to the three RAF bomber types of the era, the Vickers Valiant, the Avro Vulcan, and the Handley Page Victor. The RAF assumed that, in the event of an attack by Soviet strategic bombers, the V-Force airfields would be a prime target and the English Electric Lightning was designed to defend those airfields long enough for V-Force to take off and get clear. It was anticipated that the Soviet Union would soon deploy a supersonic bomber, which they did, the Tupolev Tu-22, NATO reporting named Blinder, introduced in 1962. Given the Blinder's top speed of Mach 1.4 and the limited role in vision for the Lightning defending airfields, emphasis for the plane's design was put on rate of climb, acceleration, and speed at the expense of range. The plane achieved this through a number of design features, the most unique being the vertically stacked and longitudinally staggered engines. The design allowed the thrust of two engines while producing only the drag of one and a half engines, a 25% reduction in drag over a traditional side-by-side -side engine design. In addition, the design allowed a low frontal area and efficient single engine type handling, as having both engines within the fuselage means that there was no asymmetrical thrust. The combination of the engine design and the radical 60-degree notched delta wing allowed not just great speed, but an exceptional climb rate. The Lightning was famous for its ability to rapidly rotate from takeoff to climb almost vertically from the runway. And if you needed extra thrust, it had a reheat. Sometimes called an afterburner, a reheat injects additional fuel into the jet pipe downstream of the turbine. The resulting heat significantly increases thrust at the cost of very high fuel consumption and decreased fuel efficiency. Reheat could be used for short, sharp takeoffs, a process that is described as being like a bullet fired from a gun. Given its design emphasis, the Lightning could be tricky to handle and was described by its pilots as like being saddled to a skyrocket. The particular aircraft being used that day, number XM-135, was in for repairs, having an electronics issue with the RAF 33rd Maintenance Unit. The 33MU, based at RAF Lynham since 1940, was a civilian manned aircraft storage unit commanded by Wing Commander Holden, which stored and maintained three types of aircraft. The English Electric Canberra Medium Bomber, the Gloucester Meteor Jet Fighter Interceptor, and the Lightning. The planes would be dispatched to RAF units as they were ready and needed. Having dispatched all of their Canberras and Meteors, the unit was due to be disbanded as soon as all the remaining Lightnings were dispatched. However, XM-135, which had been the very first full production Mark I off the assembly line and had served at the Central Flight School at Coltishaw, was having a particular electronics problem. This being the last aircraft before the unit was closed, Wing Commander Holden was under some pressure to get the plane fixed and dispatched. To make matters more complex, the unit had a qualified test pilot assigned to it, but that pilot was not qualified on the Lightning. Thus, to test XM-135, the unit had to wait until a qualified Lightning test pilot was available. The plane had a recurring electrical problem. During the first few moments of takeoff, the inverter that supplied power to the instruments would cut out, forcing a backup to kick in. That is not ideal under any circumstances, but particularly troublesome on the Lightning, where being shot like a bullet from a gun didn't give the pilot a lot of reaction time. The electricians had been unable to tamp down the problem. The test pilot, who was available, tried the plane a couple of times, but the problem persisted. Without a solution, they couldn't keep the pilot on temporary duty. The electricians decided to devise some tests which might isolate the fault and indicate roughly where and which component was at fault. They needed to test the plane on the runway, having the pilot make short runs while throwing various switches to see if they could replicate the problem and identify what was causing it. However, 
they didn't have a test pilot. Still under pressure to keep the clearance timetable, Holden found out that there would not be a qualified test pilot to do the tests for another week. But they did have an option, because Wing Commander Holden was a qualified pilot. Holden had enlisted in the RAF in 1943 and had elected to pursue a career in aircraft engineering. But the RAF had allowed him to train and earn his wings, under the theory that an engineer who was a pilot would be better able to understand the pilot's point of view when dealing with maintenance issues. He would learned to fly on the de Havilland Tiger Moth. The de Havilland Tiger Moth was a single-engine biplane first introduced in 1931. It had a maximum speed of 109 miles per hour, somewhat slower than the maximum 1300 miles per hour of the English Electric Lightning. Holden had also flown the de Havilland Canada DHC-1 Chipmunk, which while still a single-engine propeller-driven plane was at least a monoplane as opposed to a biplane, Holden had never piloted a jet aircraft. But he did not need to fly the Lightning, he just needed to taxi it on a disused runway while flipping switches. Rather than wait for the test pilot, they decided to have Taffy Holden operate the plane, which was only supposed to taxi in 30 to 40 yard bursts. They used runway 36, which was closed. The plane did not need to fly, so the canopy was removed. A Land Rover nearby would keep in contact with the tower and keep them appraised of each test. All Taffy had to do was taxi the plane a few dozen yards while flipping switches, and then make notes. The electricians would then decipher the notes to identify the location of the fault. Having never been in the cockpit of a Lightning and never flown a jet fighter, Holden did not even know how to start the engine, so one of his engineers gave him a short briefing on the operation of the engine and the throttles. Strapped in, Holden made his notes on the switches before the test, signaled to the Land Rover to get clearance for their 30 to 40 yard jaunt, throttled the plane up, and let off the brake. He described the initial punch as remarkable, as you might expect, but managed to throttle back and apply the brake in the 30 yards that was expected. As he later said of the first test, so far, so good. Now Holden moved some switches and took notes and planned for the second attempt. The Land Rover contacted the tower for clearance and he throttled up again. But this time, it did not go so well. As he throttled up, the plane shook against the brakes. But this time he throttled a little bit too far and the shaking caused the throttle to push past the gate locks for reheat. When taking off with the reheat, the throttle had something called a gate lock, which was designed to hold the engine in reheat. So, in essence, all of a sudden, Taffy Holden was the bullet being fired from the gun. To throttle back from reheat, the pilot has to push back keys that are located behind the throttle. But Holden had never used these keys, and only even knew of them because the engineer had briefly mentioned them in the five-minute briefing and Holden did not have time to search, as there were more immediate problems just in front of him. Having been told that he was only going to use another 40 yards of runway, the tower had cleared a fuel bowser and trailer to cross the runway to fuel awaiting C-130. Now zipping down the runway, Holden's first problem was not colliding with the bowser. He just missed it, but after that, runway 36 ran across the main duty runway, and a de Havilland Comet of the RAF Transport Command was taking off down that runway. The comet narrowly passed ahead of him, marking a second near-death experience in mere seconds, and he was still on the runway. But another problem was coming up quickly. The runway was running out. Still without time to find the keys that would allow him to throttle down, and with not enough room anyway, Holden did the only thing he could. He pulled back on the stick. As a stroke of good luck, the previous pilot had trimmed the aircraft for takeoff, and Taffy Holden, who had never been in a lightning cockpit until a few minutes before, was now airborne and, as they say, saddled to a skyrocket. He had almost died on the ground three times, yet was somehow still alive, and now he just had to get back on the ground. His immediate concern was to try to keep the base in view and look out for the comet that had just recently taken off. But once airborne, he was able to search for and find the keys that allowed him to throttle back. However, he was still in a pickle. Holden had no radio, no helmet, and no canopy. He thought about ejecting, but he couldn't. The safety pins that were used to make the plane safer surfacing were still in. His only choice was to land the plane. He described his first attempt to land as ridiculous, and he had to pull up and try again. The second attempt also failed, and he had to pull out again. He tried landing going the other direction and got the plane down on the third attempt. Now the problem was stopping. He looked around for and found the handle for the braking parachute, but it did not slow him as much as he wanted. 
What he did not realize is that unlike the tiger moth and the chipmunk, the lightning had a nose wheel. The planes on which he had trained all had tail wheels. He had landed like he had been trained and in doing so had crushed the block containing the braking chute cables. The braking chute had dropped off as soon as it was deployed. He kept applying the handbrake and watching the end of the runway get closer and closer, but managed to stop with about 100 yards to spare. The ground crewman, who had only before ever piloted single-engine trainers, had landed the lightning with minimum damage. At first, Holden was afraid that the incident might cost him his career, or at very least his pilot wings. But while everyone agreed that he should have waited for a qualified lightning test pilot, they also agreed that he hadn't actually broken any rules. Taffy Holden continued with the Royal Air Force until retirement. Eventually, engineers did figure out the fault that was going on with the plane. It seems that one of the circuits originally had had a ground test button installed, and while later on in the design the button was removed, the wires were still there and those were causing the short. And that shows the complexity of the plane that Taffy Holden and his crew had to keep flying. Taffy Holden eventually ended up spending a couple of years in the hospital dealing with emotional issues. He said that while he always understood the technical aspects of his flight, he had never really sat and dealt with the emotional stresses that come from such a terrifying 12 minutes. He said the entire experience gave him a much better understanding of people who might need the same kind of help after similar unfortunate occurrences. And that might be the best lesson from the entire tale. Taffy Holden passed away in 2016. And the airplane, Lightning F1 XM-135, is today on display at the Imperial War Museum at RAF Duxford in my opinion, a great museum, well worth a visit. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.